Hello. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's panel discussion, Art in the City, What New York City Has to Offer Its Artists and Architects. My name is Whitney Oldenburg. I am an artist and I'm the Director of Career Development at the Cooper Union. I've had the privilege of calling New York City my home for two se separate stretches of time, from 2010 to 2013 and again from 2017 until now. Throughout these years, I've felt as if I've lived multiple lives, each one punctuated by the city's vibrant visual culture. Whenever I reflect on my time here, my mind is immediately drawn to the art and murals that have served as bookmarks to my personal narrative. In 2017, I began working at the Cooper Union where I quickly became aware of just how many Cooper Union students came from the metropolitan area and how deeply the city's energy and opportunities shaped the education of Cooper's students. As I was gaining this understanding, by, tw by 2019, I was also participating in an artist residency at the Materials for the Arts and New York City Department of Cultural Affairs program. Not only did I feel a tremendous amount of support at MFTA, but I caught a glimpse into an art world and community very different from New York City art worlds I had previously come to understand. As part of my role at the Cooper Union, I provide career counseling to art students, which involves showca showcasing the diverse range of opportunities available to them as an alternative to the commercial gallery art space. My goal is to expand students' awareness of the multiple art worlds that exist within various communities. Additionally, I aim to shift students' perception of work by highlighting the various fields in which an artist can excel. It is with this in mind and with the appreciation and curiosity of the New York City environment that we all live in that I am excited to bring together this panel. My goals for this panel are twofold. To provide a platform that sheds lights on the alternatives available to artists in the city beyond the commercial gallery system and to showcase another model of labor that may be beneficial for artists to consider. Without further delay, I'd like to welcome and introduce our panelists. We are truly grateful for their involvement in this event. Kendall Henry, directly to my left, is an artist and curator who lives in New York City and has specialized in the field of public art for over 30 years. He illustrates that public art can be used as a tool for social engagement, civic pride, and economic development through the projects and programs he's initiated in the United States and internationally. He's currently the Assistant Commissioner of Public Art at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and an adjunct professor at NYU Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. Previously, he served as the Director of Culture and Economic Development for the City of Newburgh, New York, and Manager of Arts Programs at the MTA Art and Design. Nina Marin, two down. <laughs> as Director of the New York City Department of Transportation's art program, Nina Marin oversees implementation of public art and event-based arts and cultural programming on New York City Department of Transportation property citywide. Since joining NYC DOT in 2015, her knowledge of visual studio arts and art history have contributed to the successful execution of varied projects throughout New York City and her commitment to public programs is fueled by her dedication to the city as a native New Yorker. Elizabeth Masella is a senior public art coordinator at NYC Parks. She works closely with a diverse group of artists, community groups, arts organizations, and government agency to bring both innovative and traditional public art to parks in New York City's five boroughs. She has managed over 200 temporary public outdoor art installations and organized several exhibitions for the Arsenal Gallery in Central Park. And then Zinnia Diente um, is a public art deputy director at the New York City Department of Design and Construction, 
where she works with artists, architects, engineers, city agencies, and many others to plan, design, fabricate, and install permanent public artwork citywide. With over 20 years of experience with NYC Percent for Art program, she strives to strengthen opportunities for artists and designers to creatively improve New York City's built environment. Diente earned a BFA in 1999 from the Cooper Union School of Art. So without further delay, Kendall, if you'd like to present. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Whitney. Um, when we were in the back, we were trying to figure out who's coming to this, so I'm gonna ask a couple questions. How many people are artists? Wow, it's a whole room, practically. <laughs> Arts administrators? Okay, Koopa alumni? Art lovers? <laughs> I see some of the artists didn't raise their hands, okay. <laughs> um, so it's, it's always good to sort of do these kinds of talks because a lot of times people um, have no idea what we do, and, and we do a lot, we think we do a lot for the city uh, when it comes to the art world, and um, an artist particularly, and so it's very important to have these kinds of conversations. So um, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna, um, I, I, as Whitney mentioned, I'm at the Department of Cultural Affairs, and I run, um, I'm in the public art unit, and I run a number of programs that really work with artists and embed them within the city in different ways, uh, and to commission that work. So I'm gonna give a quick presentation of the programs that, uh, that is under my purview, and, and hopefully during some of the questions that uh, Whitney's going to provide us, you will get a lot more information about them. One of the things I will do is let you know how you could be involved or how we look at artists to be involved with these programs. <clears throat> so I cannot do anything that I do um, without these folks that are on your screen right now. And so this is, this is the staff that run the public art unit. We have Sergio Parra Lopez, who's the director of the Percent for Art program. I'm gonna get into that in a minute. Uh, Noel Calvo does our school programs. Um, David Mandel, who does everything that we do with community. And uh, Sio Man Lam, who runs our temporary, our, he's our civic art program coordinator to run our temporary art program. And um, public art has many different definitions and, and we have our own definition as, as to what that is. And it's pretty much the coming together of the community, the space, and the art, um, right? And so every time we approach a public art program, we think about these things um, in that process. So to begin with a Percent for Art program, um, Percent for Art is a program that is very common in a lot of cities um, throughout the states in different countries. It basically says that 1% of any um, city construction project must go to the commissioning of a permanent work of art. So it's a law. And so, um, and we have, we. We take a percentage of any construction project, whether it be a park, and you will see some of these types of projects when Nina and Senior is talking about their programs, and, and we, we commission an artist to do a work that is permanent, that is forever um, part of the, the facility and our, our, um, our collection, the city's collection. <clears throat> and you could see, I'm not gonna go into these projects, but I'm just gonna give you a, a quick look-see as to what they are. And for Percent for Art, um, we sometimes do open calls, but um, the artist has to be at least 18 years old, um, national or international. We don't uh, limit from who were you from to the artwork. New York City is, very, is, a, is a literal melting pot, melting pot, and so anyone is, is open. And uh, we have a registry that is open, um, that is continuously um, soliciting artists. And, um, and what this offers is, again, a permanent commission uh, on city property. So it's there forever. So. <clears throat> 100 years, it's still gonna be there, um, hopefully. So, and um, I'm just gonna give you a quick um, preview of some of the projects that are coming up. Again, I'm not gonna go into them too much, but what you see here is a typical um, types of projects. We have a couple of libraries, botanical garden, step streets, um, um, a fire engine station, and an unusual project and, that I'm working with Xenia on is an asphalt plant in, in Queens. Uh, next, uh, part of the per Percent for Art program is a public art for public schools program. And we work with our colleagues at uh, School Construction Authority to run this program. And again, every single school that is being built or renovated or expanded, uh, we like to incorporate an artist and go through a, a, a process to select an artist into that, into that program. And you could get a glimpse of some of the newer ones that were just recently installed on, on this uh, screen. 
And for our Public Art for Public Schools program, again, it's very similar to our Percent for Art program in that it's open to all artists. Um, and it's, again, the registry is open to, to anyone else and it's a constant, um, you could constantly apply within it. And it's, again, a permanent commission in the school. And it's, um, a lot of times we try to incorporate projects that are, that could be folded into the curriculum of the school, uh, which is very key and important. And then we have our Public Artist in Residency um, program, uh, or PEER. And this is where we embed artists in city government. And this is an incredible uh, thing that we do in, because we think of artists as creative problem solvers. And so we embed artists into city agencies with the hope of, in, with, of influencing policy. And the artists work with us for a year. Uh, half that year is really learning about the agency and the other half is implementing a project from the, the knowledge that, that they have acquired through that. And um, we're in between two residencies right now. So this is our 2020 uh, cohort. Um, and so you see we, we're doing something with Melanie Crean, um, Stolen, and uh, something that's coming up to, to, to look out for is a, a project we're working with um, the Department of, of Records and Information <coughs> Services. Um, look out for that in, in June, for uh, around Juneteenth. And uh, for those, we, we do, we do a, a call um, for primarily socially engaged artists, artists who are working on issues that are um, at the forefront of, of what we're dealing with in the world today. And it's a call, it's an open call that happens mostly in the spring. And it's again, a year long residency uh, with the city agency. And this is the current artist that we're working with for our 2022, 2023. A residency with the New York City Health and Hospitals, Department of, Department of Design and Construction, which is Zinia's agency, Homeless Services, and the Prevention of Hate Crime. City Canvas is another one of our programs. Uh, they have 300 plus miles of construction fences, and um, we have a program to do with that as well. And this is basically where an artist would uh, propose an artwork with um, one of our presenters, with our one presenter currently, uh, to place those artworks in um, on, the, on the construction sites. And we've been doing a lot of work with NYCHA and, um, and New York City Buildings is a collaborator in that project as well. And again, City Campus is any artist who works in two-dimensional two media from photography to uh, painting and, and uh, any two-dimensional um, format. And it's open, it's an application through Artbridge currently. And again, it's a temporary installation uh, on the construction site. And um, Public art, it, public art is community engagement is another one of our programs, a lot of programs. <laughs> and uh, this is where we actually, we use public art to engage in a conversation around a particular issue. And we usually tie it to a project that we have coming up. Um, so we, we're about to do a, a, one of our monument commissions and we're having a conversation around what it means to have a monument to uh, this particular family. And we, are, we have conducted a number of, a series of talks ar around their legacy. And again, this is, uh, towards um, socially engaged artists, this is curated. So we really look to artists who are dealing with some of these issues and contact them directly and say, hey, uh, we want you to do what it is that you do to talk about these particular issues. And again, this is for temporary art to basically engage in conversations around a topic. Monuments and memorials is something else that we also do as well, um, which is a, a hot topic now and has been for a few years. Uh, this is, these are two, one is uh, in the process of design, which is Shirley Chisholm Memorial in Prospect Park and one that was completed recently uh, by Melissa Calderon at um, uh, Roberto Clemente Plaza in the Bronx. Um, typical as the percent for our program, 18 and older, um, open to artists of the world, um, open call or curatorial. And again, it's a permanent um, forever um, commission in, in our collection. And um, that's a quick rundown as to what we do here and hopefully um, throughout the conversation, we'll get a little bit more information about that. I'm gonna hand it over to Nina. Thanks, Kendall, and thanks, Whitney, for the introduction. As Whitney mentioned, I'm the Director of Public Art at the New York City Department of Transportation's Art Program. Uh, we were speaking before the panel that not everyone knows what the acronym DOT necessarily stands for. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little, some quick facts about what the Department of Transportation maintains. What are we doing? Um, so we have a major transportation infrastructure that includes over 6,300 miles of streets and highways, over 12,000 sidewalks, 
over 1,000 miles of bike lanes, 800 bridges and tunnels, a million street signs, which is a lot, um, 13,000 signalized intersections, 315,000 street lights, and a Staten Island, the ferry fleet. And I read these all out to you to really paint a picture of kind of the canvases that we're working with for public art, which we'll, we'll get into. So now that you know what DOT stands for, the Department of Transportation's art program was founded in 2008. Uh, we oversee temporary and permanent public artwork installations on DOT property. Uh, since 2008, we've installed over 400 temporary works, and we have 22 permanent artworks in our collection, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, we partner with a diverse body of professional artists, community-based organizations, uh, other nonprofits, and cultural institutions to beautify our infrastructure. We really see these properties as canvases for artwork. As I mentioned, we work um, and manage maintenance and conservation of DOT's permanent art collection, which consists of 22 works, and seven new artworks are in progress with uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs Percent for Art program, which you all just learned about. Um, the, the way in which permanent artwork is installed on DOT property is only through that program. Um, our temporary program get, gives us a lot more flexibility to um, install artwork for up to an 11 month period so we can try out different materials and techniques whereas temp permanent art is installed for, as Kendall mentioned, forever. The art program was founded, as I mentioned in 2008, um, under four main principles. To create attractive corridors, so beautification, to activate public space and create areas where people want to be and use uh, the public realm, to build community partnerships, so working with different artists, community-based organizations, and maintaining ongoing partnerships with them, and to promote healthy lifestyle. Again, get New Yorkers and visitors out in our public spaces wanting to use our bike lanes because there's an artwork that they want to see, um, whether that's a destination for them or they see it every day. Building upon those goals, um, since the program was founded, we've really made it um, integral to our program to extend city funding to nonprofit organizations and to, to help further their uh, mission in enhancing communities. We're proud to have some initiatives where we can provide funding for temporary projects to artists and community groups to create artwork, which again is something that we're proud of. Um, establish meaningful relationships with those community stakeholders, have ongoing relationships, um, not just a one-time partnership, um, although we do like to get to new partners and work throughout all the five boroughs, um, and introducing arts and cultural resources where the access might be limited, and providing jobs to artists, providing them funding to do their work in the city. So on our, our, my first slide, I was mentioning, you know, what is DOT, what are we overseeing, and I love this drawing here that the former director of the program put together to really show where are our canvases, what, are, what is eligible for artwork to be installed on, and we have a site selection guide that, that lives on our website um, where whenever someone comes to us, my first question is, what is your site? because that really defines how big an artwork can be, what type of medium we're working with, how long does it make sense for something to be installed, um, what is the audience, is it near a major transportation hub, is it not near anything and we want to bring people to that location. So every day, day to day in the program, we're looking at what, what transportation infrastructure is eligible for us to put art on. And what's great about having a temporary program is we're able to try something out. If it doesn't work at a certain site, we can move it to another. So that gives us some flexibility. We love before and after as a DOT to show some of the great work that we do through our street improvement projects. Um, this is a great example of a site type that's an asphalt pedestrianized space. So this was an intersection outside of a school that was transformed to make it a safer crossing for students. And instead of painting the spaces, which you can see on the bottom here, those would have traditionally been painted with a, a standard beige treatment. We work with an artist to beautify those and make it more exciting. So how to get involved with us, where, where if I'm an artist and if I'm a community-based organization, how do I apply? 
Um, as mentioned, we can provide funding and we release open calls um, throughout the year for our community commissions initiative where we're working with community-based organizations um, to create site responsive art um, at a pre-selected location. Uh, our barrier beautification program where we're painting bike lanes, asphalt art activations, which we just saw an example of. Um, and our art interventions program allows um, organizations and artists to apply to the program at any time if they have funding secured. Um, we accept applications on a rolling basis and it makes it flexible for artists to apply it at, at any time. And kind of again, sharing a little bit of the application process, how are we selecting and who is selecting uh, the artists that apply to us? Um, DOT has an art advisory committee that consists of six arts professionals that represent all five boroughs, different backgrounds, and they're reviewing every application that comes in through our open calls. Um, and we're looking at public safety, artistic merit, organizational capacity, artwork durability, site suitability, and we're not only looking at it with our art advisory committee, but we're working internally within the within the agency to make sure that uh, operating units review as well. I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth to talk a little bit more. Um, thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you, Whitney, and the rest of my co-panelists. Um, you'll probably see a lot of overlap, um, I think, between my presentation and uh, Nina's, because what we do is very similar. Um, so as it says here, I'm Elizabeth Masella. I'm the Senior Public Art Coordinator at New York City Parks. Um, I'll start with, we do program, oh, well, I will get into the outdoor public art, which is the uh, vast majority of what we're doing, but we do have one indoor space called the Arsenal Gallery. It's in the park's headquarters in Central Park, uh, which is at, uh, on Fifth Avenue at 64th Street. Um, the Arsenal Gallery is dedicated to examining themes of nature, urban space, wildlife, New York City parks, and park history. Um, the breadth of the shows that we have every year, which is about four to five um, shows, um, is very varied. Just to give you an idea, last year um, we had a show of, of photographs taken during the summer of 1968 by um, a photographer named Katrina Thomas, who was employed by the Lindsay administration. Um, she photographed play streets, which is kind of like a precursor to the open streets that were um, around the city during COVID. Uh, we also had a show uh, focusing on um, recent park redesigns that employed um, principles used by Frederick Law Olmsted in honor of his 200th birthday. Uh, we also had a show um, featuring work by Latinx artists depicting um, flowers and trees and plants um, from their native countries. Um, so that just gives you an overall a sense of that. We also have an annual wreath interpretations exhibition, which some of you might be familiar with. We just had our 40th year um, for that, um, which is people making wreaths out of unusual materials. <laughs> um, we don't have a deadline for applications, so that is rolling. Um, we do consider all media, but we do have limited space for three-dimensional objects. Um, it's a very unique space. It is used um, by parks employees for meetings. It's also used for events and presentations. Um, but it's one of, I think, New York's best kept secrets. Um, if you haven't been there, it's open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. Um, so what I'm primarily um, doing at parks is the, I run the Art in the Parks program, uh, which permits temporary public artworks in parks citywide. Um, temporary public artworks can be on view for a few weeks, up to a year. Um, our program now is entering its 56th year, if my math is correct. Uh, we were founded in 1967. At that time, the Department of Cultural Affairs was part of the Parks Department. Um, so they created this program to allow artists to exhibit their art in parks around the city. Um, since then, we've um, produced over 2,000 public artworks um, by 1,300 um, notable and emerging artists and over 200 parks in all five boroughs. Um, you might ask why art in the parks. Um, there's a number of motivating factors. Um, aesthetic, beautifying the park, uh, visual enhancement, um, intellectual, mental stimulation, social, um, artworks can be participatory or engage um, park visitors uh, with the artwork directly. 
Um, there's economic reasons, you know, supporting tourism and the creative class, um, creating like an arts destination within a park. Um, it's also promotional, advancing parks mission, um, you know, bringing attention to, to what it is we do at parks and maybe bringing attention to, um, you know, an area of the park that might be underutilized. Uh, we work with a wide variety of, um, of groups um, and artists, um, including public art nonprofits, parks partners, business improvement districts, commercial galleries, cultural institutions, independent artists, and community groups um, to um, execute their artwork. Um, as I mentioned before, installations may last from two weeks up to one year. Most are typically on view for three to six months. Um, exhibitions uh, that are shorter are typically um, handled by our special events offices, um, and that's a little bit of a shorter process. We typically um, encourage applicants to submit at least six months in advance. Um, if you're thinking about doing a performance, something that's you know one day in duration, you only need to apply for that 21 to 30 days in advance. Um, a lot of, I think sometimes a misconception is that our office handles anything involving art and parks, um, but what we're primarily working with is um, three-dimensional artworks, two-dimensional artworks, murals, et cetera. Um, technically, any park in New York City can host public art, um, and nearly one in, tech, ten, one in 10 parks has done so. Um, not all public art is traditional, large-scale sculpture. Um, as I mentioned, we do murals. We also do a number of um, maybe lighter touch projects like you see on the screen here. This is a fence installation in Bronx Park. Um, not every artwork, you know, has to be big and expensive to have um, an important impact. Um, so we also, for the Art in the Parks program, there is no deadline for proposals. Uh, we do encourage you to submit, again, six months in advance. Um, our submission requirements are listed out here. We do have this available on our website, um, which is nyc.gov slash parks slash art. Um, for your proposal, you just want to make sure, I, don't, I won't go super into depth into this, but um, the d main details of the artwork, um, what it's made out of, dimensions, weight, installation method, anchoring procedure, um, if it's an existing work, photographs or slides of the artwork, if it's a new artwork, um, detailed drawings or a maquette, um, artist statement and resume, installation budget, uh, propose, proposed duration and exhibition period, um, proposed location, um, and images of previous work. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a location in mind. We're happy to do kind of some matchmaking on that with you um, to find an appropriate location. Um, but you're also welcome to apply, you know, for your neighborhood park or a park that you feel a particular connection to. Um, the review process, we review um, through a departmental panel. Um, so that would include um, the Art and Antiquities staff, which is myself and my colleagues. Uh, we also share with our operations staff. They know our parks very well um, and can help provide further advice on, you know, what may or may not work for a certain park best locations in the park, um, things like that on the park level. Um, we all are always thinking about safety, durability, site suitability, which can all be, I think, interpreted in different ways. But when you're putting art outdoors, there's a lot of things to consider. Human interaction, nature, um, all the seasons, change in temperature, um, things like that. Um, following approval of a proposal, we issue a license agreement, um, which is essentially a permit, um, and we also share the projects with local community boards. The community is aware of the project. Um, so part of our program, we unfortunately do not have any funding to provide. Uh, we have, on occasion, <laughs> our, pro our program's been around for, you know, almost 60 years, and I think maybe we've been victims of our own success that we have no shortage of projects happening. We do on occasion have privately funded grant opportunities. Uh, we just had two that closed um, that are park specific um, for local artists. Um, so that we do promote those heavily when we have them because they are a few and far between, but I'd say one or two a year. Um, so artists are responsible for all aspects of the exhibition, um, you know, from 
fabrication, transport, installation, site restoration, et cetera. Um, selection criteria, I think, echoes a lot of what Mina um, shared. Um, artis artistic merit, I think, can be interpreted pretty broadly. Um, site suitability, organizational capacity, artwork, durability, and public safety. Um, and I'll just touch very lightly on our permanent art and monuments. Um, so the other part of the Art and Antiquities Division, um, which the Art in the Parks program is a part of, um, is the permanent art and monuments collection. Uh, we have over 800 monuments around the city, which range from you know, commemorative tablets to triumphal arches. Um, we have a monuments crew um, with one uh, senior conservator and uh, five crew members. They do 500 plus maintenances annually um, and 80, per, uh, 80 plus major conservation projects completed to date. Um, if there's anyone in here who is a student in a conservation program or as a sculptor, uh, we also have a, an apprenticeship program during the summer called the Citywide Monument Conservation Program uh, that offers privately funded paid internships for graduate level candidates um, to get hands-on experience. Um, new monuments are generally paid for either through Percent for Art or they're also, they can also be um, privately funded. Um, and there's a lot of considerations that go into that. And typically, we have one or two permanent artworks added per year. And that is the end of my, <laughs> my presentation. It's a lot of, um, we have a lot of artwork out there. Um, I think right now, we have about 50 pieces on view. So, <laughs> and I'll turn it over to Xenia. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Kendall, Nina, and Elizabeth, and thank you, Whitney, for the, the invitation. Uh, my name is Xenia Diende. I am a Cooper alum. Um, <laughs> um, I guess a, t a moment to get personal. I, I found this photo of myself uh, across the street in the Great Hall 30 years ago as a junior in high school. And um, I started through the Saturday program, and then um, I was lucky enough to get accepted to Cooper. And um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to go to an art school without you know the, the full full tuition scholarship. And I guess another full circle moment for me is I, I was born ten blocks north of here, so it's like quite significant for me to be here as a professional arts administrator. Um, but I'm here today, um, I work at the Department of Design and Construction, and it's the city's primary um, public works um, construction manager. Uh, we build on behalf of other city agencies, um, public facilities and infrastructure. Um, yeah, you could visit their website at www.newyorkcity.gov slash DDC. Um, they're always looking for, if uh, artists wear many hats, um, they're always looking for architects, engineers, contractors, all kinds of different skills. Um, but about DDC's public art program, uh, our main focus is supporting cultural affairs, um, the Percent for Art program. Um, but more uh, increasingly, we've been handling um, more artwork conservation on uh, existing uh, city-owned facilities and um, uh, as well as more artwork at construction sites and then some special projects such as the Public Artists in Residence program. Um, and then if I could linger here for a moment um, with one of the prompts from uh, Whitney in terms of like what are the kind of uh, range of public art opportunities which you heard uh, a lot and, and in terms of like these, uh, when I think about it from the Percent for Art program making these permanent works of public art, it takes, it takes many, uh, include, you know, in addition to the primary uh, public artist, to uh, many to support the public artist, um, ranging from engineers to make the structural engineering to the architects, designers, uh, the art fabricators with all the different kind of specializations depending on the type of durable materials, art installers, um, and uh, art documenters, people, you know, a very, with strong photography and video skills, um, to name a few. Um, yeah, and, and it, if I didn't mention any, yeah, art con conservation, historic preservation. Um, so my main focus of this presentation is the New York City Percent for Art program. And uh, we are one of the, um, I guess, uh, one of 
several agencies that uh, build on behalf of the Department of Cultural Affairs. And um, we are currently managing about 40 active percent art projects. We've completed over 60 projects and uh, worked on behalf of 20 different city agencies um, since 1996. Um, and my focus of the presentation is more about the project management. What happens uh, when you get a, a percent for art commission with uh, the DDC? Um, so after you are uh, selected and nominated and you sign your contract, you have this group called the core review group who are essentially stewarding your project for the multiple years you're developing this, um, uh, your artwork. And um, the core review group consists of cultural affairs, uh, the project sponsor, um, uh, Department of Design and Construction where I work, and the prime consultant, usually an, an architecture or engineering firm. Um, and uh, because we're working in um, a public works kind of um, environment and like, schedule is very important, the percent for art um, project management schedule is overlaid the, on the main capital project schedule. So the goal would be to that the artwork, the artist design phase also takes place during the capital projects design phase. And then the artist's uh, fabrication and installation phase also takes place during the construction phase of the artwork. Um, so the first phase is called conceptual design. Um, this is where the artist um, uh, list, you know, does a listening tour and uh, gathers feedback, learns about the site, uh, makes sketches, um, and makes uh, and begins to make drawings and uh, mapping of, of the of their actual proposal. Uh, I'm, I'll be using different artists, um, I guess, works uh, to illustrate this process. Um, after it's vetted by all these different city agencies, um, the artist presents their work at the community board. And then they present to this other group called the Public Design Commission, um, uh, based in City Hall. And uh, after they receive the approvals, then they can move forward to the next phase, which is called preliminary design. And preliminary design is essentially like a final design where you are now, um, the artist is now dimensioning the work and making renderings, getting more specific, um, hiring professionals to help them with the, the engineering um, if needed. Um, the, the primary um, architects or engineers um, are developing the construction drawings and there's a lot of coordination that happens. And here's some examples of some engineering drawings. Um, and here's an example of another uh, uh, Cooper alum, uh, Paul Valinsky, making a model during um, his preliminary design to convey what he's proposing for the Ocean Breeze Athletic Center for the Parks Department. Um, or Ola Lake and Jafus for the Bronx Animal Care Center. He made uh, these beautiful renderings, who happens to be also uh, architect slash artist, hybrid human. Um, <laughs> Um, and then you, he's also demonstrating, you know, how is it going to be fabricated? And like, so these kind of drawings show and uh, explain um, how, it, how it's going to be made and conveyed to, uh, you know, future fabricators if, if, they, if they don't make it themselves. Here's an architect interpreting the artist's drawings into the construction documents. Um, then finally, there's the fabrication phase. And... Um, the artists, if they're not making it themselves, they work with arts fabricators. And here's an example of Shalene Rodriguez working with a terracotta um, manufacturer and the shop drawings for their uh, review and uh, approval. Um, or Sam Kuntz for the Department of Transportation. Here's, at, here's a 50% inspection of a demolished DOT facility that she wanted to use their former brick to make a 200 foot long uh, mosaic. So it was also a, like lead certified or added a point to their lead points. Um, Hank Willis Thomas, um, here he's uh, visiting the bronze foundry for his, uh, his sculpture called Unity. 
or um, Julian Laverdier, uh, also another Cooper alum, um, at a metal fabricator making his work for a, a fire department. Um, uh, and here, artists visit the construction site, a lot of conversation to coordinate and make sure um, the artwork will be installed correctly. And then finally the day comes after many years to install the work. They make sure to get the permits correct, uh, all the logistics correct. And um, here's an example of Matthew Geller installing his work at Myrtle Plaza or Hank Willis Thomas installing at Tillery Street. And then after the work is installed, the, it's closed out. The, the photos are taken, the catalog and documentation happens. And when, when it's done with the DDC, that's when it, the work becomes um, a, a public art. And, um, and yeah, and it's yeah, for everybody to enjoy. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, so I have a few questions, and then at the very end, we're going to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, but just to get started, um, I always feel that um, public art and public art proposals, it, it sort of feels like it's only for the established artist and, you know, or mid-career, late to mid-career. Um, and so for the young artists or the emerging artists um, who are interested in public art programs, what advice would you give them to increase their chances of being selected? Um, I can start with that. Um, you know, I think at least um, with the Art in the Parks program, when we get a proposal, we work very closely with artists. So, if, um, you know, if there's points in the proposal, say an artist has only done a few large sculptures. Uh, we have a lot of experience and we're happy to share some of that knowledge with the artist um, to bring the uh, proposal to a place where we feel like it would be safe and durable enough. Um, I would say that I wouldn't discourage younger or early career artists from doing it. I think doing your research beforehand is something that can be really helpful, like looking into materials um, and a willingness to collaborate, not only with you know, the Parks Department for our concerns, but I think collaboration maybe with community groups or just um, thinking about all the different things that can happen in parks and just keeping an open mind are, is, is important advice I would give. And not every artwork needs to be you know, a 10 foot tall bronze sculpture. Uh, we do plenty of work, also public art is for two dimensional artists. There's mural opportunities. Um, we also do quite a few um, fence installations with um, photographic banners. Um, so if you're a photographer, you can still participate in the public art process. Um, so I think, you know, we do, and also some of the most successful projects we've done have been the lighter touch um, you know, fence installations and things like that um, that have a really big impact and are colorful um, but don't require a lot of technical knowledge. Um, so I guess that's what I would, I would say. I don't know if um, my fellow I, panelists have other advice I would, too. I would just build on the fact that um, for DOT's program, having a temporary opportunity, sometimes those are a lot smaller where the budgets are kind of more manageable. It's an opportunity for an emerging artist to work with the city agency for the first time, get that on their resume, fill out the fiscal paperwork that we ask you to do, familiarize yourself with um, what it means to, to do public art on a smaller commission, like painting a bike lane. Um, we have a lot of emerging artists whose goal one day is to do that 10 foot, foot bronze sculpture, but starting on a smaller scale and exploring different mediums can, as, just as a resume builder too, um, every opportunity helps get you to that final goal that you have. And, and also as Elizabeth mentioned, as arts administrators, we are there every step of the way with you. And I think that's very, what's very unique about all of our programs is it's not, we're not just permitting the work. We're there offering our expertise and, and in the weeds with you. And I'm going to add that it's a, it's a huge misconception that you have to have um, public art experience to do what um, Nina and Elizabeth is talking about. Um, about 85 to 90% of the artists that do permanent art for us have never done public art before. 
And so um, what Nina and Elizabeth is talking about is they really hold your hand throughout the process. And, and so um, you, you come in, you, you, all is required is that you do what it is that you do best. And so that, as being an artist and working in the material that you work with, and, uh, and then we guide you through the process. And so again, most of the, from the Hank Willis Thomas piece to some of the pieces of artists you may not be familiar with, this is, some of them is the first public artwork. And um, so don't dissuade from experimenting with some ideas, um, you know, apply and whatnot, and we'll hold your hand through the process. Great, and um, I think a few of you did touch upon the jury process, but on average, is there, how many applications do you receive? And then my other question was, um, what are some reasons that a project proposal will, might not be selected, even if they make it to the final, the final rounds? I mean, I can. S Everyone's looking at me. Um, <laughs> we through, depends on the opportunity. I'll start with the easier question: the number of applications that we receive, typically corresponds directly to the amount of funding that we are potentially offering. Um, so it can range between 50 to 250 applications for a given open call. I think since I've been at the program, each year that we release new opportunities and the program becomes more ingrained in everyone's uh, you know, frame of mind, we get more applications. Um, so the review panel, and, and which I talked about a little bit in the presentation, we have an arts advisory committee. So we pull on many different uh, arts professionals' backgrounds to help us review proposals. Um, what gets really difficult is when you have a bunch of great proposals and how do you differentiate between the two? What is a tiebreaker? And I'm sure Kendall or others have some uh, input on that as well. But um, it can become pretty competitive and I, know, and I hear from artists that that can also be discouraging um, and I think we see some of the same artists apply over and over again, and they, they always make, sometimes they'll make it to the top five every time, and they don't get the call. So I think keeping at it um, is, is really important because of how competitive it is. So, so for us with the permanent art, um, we, we have about a panel a week, and each panel has about, uh, we see about 30 to 40 artists per panel. Um, so that, that's quite a few. And one of the criteria that we look at when we select an artist is that the work that they produce in the proposal is, is site specific, and I no, no, note the air quotes. Um, so whatever that means to you. Um, how, what inspires you about the space that causes you to do the proposal that you're doing, right? That, that's very key, and, and that's some of what you describe in, in your presentation. Uh, when a proposal is not selected, um, well, there's two reasons why a proposal is not selected. One is because Somebody picked another one, but they may be all good, be good, and like what Nina was talking about earlier. But if your proposal is not selected because of, of a negative reason, it's because um, you chose to do something that's not the core of what you do as an artist. And, and let me try to say it in a different kind of way. So when we look at your work, we, we, we select you from your past work, from what you do in your studio in, in, in your, for gallery work. And we want you to reflect that in a proposal for a permanent work, but really think about the space and the environment and the audience. And so when there's a disjunct, dis, something is disjointed about these two things, it doesn't look like it's your work anymore, then it, it has a negative effect on you being selected. I also wanna add that um, just because you do not get a, a project from a proposal, that doesn't mean it was a bad proposal. We always encourage artists to add that proposal to their portfolio as a way of really thinking. So, so when you review that, so when others review it or see it, they, they see how you conceive public space uh, given what you do in your studio. So that's very two key points I wanted to put out there. Yeah, I would say also I'm always happy to give feedback on if, if you've submitted for one of our opportunities where we do have an open call, I'm always happy to provide feedback to artists, um, you know, for the next time or, or maybe if there were any weak points. Um, we're always happy to have those conversations. And, and like Kendall said, if a proposal doesn't work um, you know, for a particular grant opportunity, I'm always happy to reach out to artists too and just say, you know, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other parks and we'd be happy to work with you to find a location um, for that artwork. Um, and then I guess the second part of the question, I would say like maybe what really leaps at what's left out to me on, on panels I've served on or, or panels I've organized is 
Um, I feel like I'm always drawn to proposals where you can tell the artist has spent time in the park and is thinking about you know, different aspects of the park and, and their proposal really speaks to maybe the community, it's within um, some bit of the park history. I think um, you know, those are, are things that sometimes might put one proposal over another. We spoke, um, before we spoke about uh, things that oftentimes the general public uh, doesn't understand about um, public art. And I was wondering if you could touch upon some of those things. Maybe, um, Zinnia, if you want to lead us. I don't, know, I don't know how to answer that particular <laughs> question. Um, I, I feel like, yeah, e everybody does have a, both a, a specialized knowledge of, of, of place or, so each project I know I work on, it's always a learning curve about the, the site and the place and the, the project team and the, and the stewarding of that um, public art commission for over years. I was only gonna add just the unpredictability of public art is um, like you can't please everyone. I learned that phrase from Kendall. Um, <laughs> it just, it, when, you, when you're working in the public, it's a, it's a very different experience than in a gallery setting, which may seem obvious as I'm saying it out loud, but it's learning that hands-on. Um, I mean, every project that I work on, I, I learn something new. You know, you don't have all the answers. And um, because you're working in the public, there is many, many opinions and perspectives that maybe you didn't think about before the project happened. And that's a very exciting part as well as unknown um, about commissioning public art. And, and we each have that friend that will be very honest with us. Um, tap into that friend and say, hey, I'm trying to do this in the public environment. What do you think, really? Um, to sort of latch on to what Nina was saying, it's, it's you put something out there with good intentions and it's perceived in a different way that you intended, um, expect that to happen. Um, like, you cannot please everyone. Please don't expect to please anyone. Um, and, and hope that the work actually creates uh, a dialogue um, and uh, introduces new, audience, new audiences to your work, you know? So be very flexible, um, particularly when you're working with a commissioning agency. Um, they know the spaces more than you do. Uh, you know your art more than they do. So, you know, put together, um, collaborate. Collaboration is very key and flexibility. As an artist, I often feel a little uncomfortable about the idea of making art um, for a community that I haven't lived in um, or know intimately. Um, and I think there's lots of expectations or when you read applications, it seems like there should uh, be, that should occur. Um, can you discuss your views about uh, relationship between artists or um, the artwork and the audience it's serving? I mean, I, this is something I think we think a lot about in my program, um, you know, and I think the most successful projects, again, it's not necessarily always from an artist who lives in the neighborhood or has a deep connection to the neighborhood, but they are, you can tell that their artwork, they, that they've thought about it, um, they've spent time there, um, and that has been reflected back in the artwork. Um, but I will say there are also plenty of communities around the city that are open to everything. They just want art to be there. So, um, you know, our job is also to do our best to match public artwork with, um, you know, a location that we feel is appropriate. But I think as we've all said, one thing you learn is not every artwork is for everyone as best you might might try to make those uh, connections and those and those strengths, but you know what it is what we're doing is temporary so um, It's there for a moment in time and then it leaves and you know, maybe pops up somewhere else Yeah, I'm gonna add to that as well um, so w Working with working with community is always a good buzzword, right? Uh, it sounds good particularly when you're doing a public artwork because community is a very big component to that uh, one is one, who is defining that community, and particularly if it's not yours, um, you know, make that clear. And when you say work with community, go beyond that. Name names, name organizations, name you know how that what that looks like. 
Is it you know a couple of um, meetings or conversations and with who and where and when? So so that will you know perk our ears up and say oh they know what they're talking about because we hear it all the time. I'm going to be working with the community, but if it doesn't go beyond that, then we we don't um, we don't trust that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> so um, so yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah, I think also like community engagement is another buzzword or working with volunteers and um, that is a very surface level. It's, there's many more layers that go into that type of work um, and there's no um, like scientific process for how to do that in a specific location. Um, so just adding that to the conversation, I think also temporary versus permanent have very different levels of um, community engagement that um, are actually requirements of the projects. You know, the way that Elizabeth and I present information to the, to the community is very different for temporary projects versus a permanent project. Um, so those all are factors when, we're, when we think about the word community um, as part of uh, public artwork. If I could add to, um, I'm very excited for artists that do get selected for percent of art commissions <coughs> because they are entering a very, uh, a New York City public process and they're working with all these different city agencies, all these different stakeholders. They will, um, if not, uh, yeah, learn how to learn about the community boards and learn about like civic space. And um, yeah, I'm very excited for the artists to figure out that blending of their artwork and, and site. And the community board is just one group of people, right? Like that's um, not, doesn't always represent the entire community. So figuring out how to, how to go beyond that um, is also a part of the process. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna add something, because Xenia, you mentioned you're very excited about ours. Um, yeah, because we have noticed that uh, it's not for everybody, right? And so I've, two things happen. One. You've, you've gone through the process, which is sometimes a hard process, and it, you know, it could be a little tough sometimes, and you get out of it and you're like, oh my God, this was the best thing I've ever happened, and you know, it's great, or I'll never do this again, right? So um, keep that in mind as well, and that's okay, that's okay. Um, but it, it's, when, when it is, when it comes out well, you know, you kind of forget the bad parts, and, and you want to do it again, right? And so, but again, it's not for everybody. On that note, um, how do topics such as insurance, liability, and engineering come into play when working on public art projects, and what is your role in addressing these issues? Who wants to take this first? <laughs> <laughs> well, those are all very intimidating words, I think, to someone who doesn't have experience. Like, when I hear the word insurance, I immediately am panicking, um, let alone having to explain that to somebody. Um, so I think those are all very different topics, and I... Um, engineering, maybe um, I can start there, which is a little more straightforward um, from a safety perspective, right? Like we're looking at, there are, there's no room for mistakes on engineering. When we're installing um, a public artwork on city property in the public realm, we have to make sure that it's safe. We have to make sure that a uh, if it's a windy day, it's not gonna fall over. So really focusing on the safety, the public safety aspect when thinking about the engineering report and explaining the why. Like, why are we doing this? Why are we asking you to provide this to us? Um, and the same goes for working through insurance and other, what was the other word? What were, liability. Oh, liability. liability, oh God, yeah. <laughs> um, for the DOT art program, we, a, most of the time are working with a, an organization that holds um, commercial liability insurance for the artist. So it's a partnership where we're working with that organization and that way it's less of a burden on the artist um, to have to navigate that. A lot of artists don't have commercial liability insurance. Um, so relying on a partner organization and having those strong relationships can help us work through kind of that, uh, what might seem like a roadblock. And I think, I guess maybe a, a way to demystify the term liability is essentially you're, you're putting this large object out into a public space and it is not our property essentially. So it's just thinking about, and I think the way our program is designed is it is also like the insurance is to protect you as well. Um, you know, that right. every, everyone's covered there. Um, so, and I think 
Nina and I probably do a lot to try and make it less scary <laughs> for people. Because, um, yeah, you think you've never taken out an insurance policy. You don't know what to look for. Um, but we do our best to simplify and demystify the process as much as possible. Um, yeah, maybe at the DDC with, with the percent for art projects, there are uh, set budgets that are made and then an artist is asked, you know, throughout the life of the project to update their budget. And things they need to budget for is first pay themselves, uh, but there are I itemized um, in terms of how much they'll allocate for their production, how much will they allocate for their insurance, um, or the engineering, hiring other professionals to support what they're making. So it would be part and parcel of their, their budget. And I will um, mention too, when we're working with engineer, or asking an artist to find an engineer can also be like kind of a intimidating process. And the Department of Cultural Affairs has an artist services list that has um, a resource, it's a resource list that has um, engineering firms, fabrication firms. Are there insurance? Yep, information, who to contact about that. So I love being able to share that with artists and um, although it's a long document, it's a good thing that it's a long document. There's a lot of different um, contacts and, and resources. Yeah, I, I see people going, like, oh my God, what? <laughs> um, engineering and you know, insurance. Now, so again, like I, like I mentioned earlier, we hold your hands to the entire process. We don't expect you to come in knowing any of this stuff. And uh, like, ne like Nina mentioned, we have a, a, a document called Artist Services List. Um, it's uh, something we just give out to anyone who wants it to, you know, with individuals who cover a lot of these things, so, um, so yeah. And I will, oh, sorry, I was just gonna add about murals, which we do a lot of in the art program, is a very different requirement. Like when we're putting paint on a wall, the, the liability for that is, is much different than if we're installing a sculpture that's interactive and has lighting components. So there is a way, if, if insurance feels intimidating or, or there's a way to, you know, if you don't wanna worry about that, you just wanna do a public art project, a mural is a good way to, to think about that as a first step. And, and for those that might have these different specializations and skills, they could reach out to Cultural Affairs and add your names <laughs> to this uh, artist yes. services list. I, would, I was just gonna add, I probably send it out multiple times a week. <laughs> Same. <laughs> All right, great. Um, I'm going to now segue to talk about your personal uh, careers. Um, what led you to your current position uh, and what sparked your interest in working for a government department? If each one of you want to answer, please. Um, well, we're working for me, working at DDC was my second job outside of college. And uh, the job opening was called an art program manager in the architecture and engineering um, unit. And um, going to a place like Cooper Union where it's art, architecture, and engineering, I'm like, check, let me go there. <laughs> and so that, that's what led me into city government. Um, I started my undergrad in um, uh, thinking I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a photographer. I there, was in a, a, a visual arts school. I had a very rigid studio schedule. And I soon realized that wasn't what I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be on the, another side of art, not making art myself. Um, so that was my first realization that I was interested in public art and um, being involved in that field. And I interned at the Department of Transportation, and it was a summer internship program, and I remember when we had the, um, the first, like the orientation for the interns, uh, the HR woman that was leading it uh, shared that everyone always asks, how do I get a job through an internship? And she talked about how important internships are and how it's one long interview process, and not to feel like you're too good for an internship or you're too good to do a certain task, and I think that's what got me to where I am um, at, at DOT? Um, I am not an artist, but I did study art history. Um, and I actually work, so I've been at Parks now this time around for seven years, um, but I worked there in 2011 for a one year position as the monuments coordinator. Um, and it was really interesting to me, I think, to be an arts professional within a much larger, much, much larger agency where the focus was really not on art. Um, and 
so that position ended. I, I worked at Materials for the Arts for a couple years. I also worked at an auction house. Um, and then my current position opened up and I was lucky enough to come back to Parks. Um, so I just, I think it is a very unique position. You know, I'm meeting all different, um, not just people out in the world, but like within the agency talking to foresters, um, wildlife specialists, wetland specialists. Like I think that is really interesting, I think, about each of our jobs is, is um, or at least what wanted, made me want to go back to Parks was to be able to work directly with artists within this much larger mich mission of green public spaces and parks. Um. I also started as an intern at Cultural Affairs, um, and that was a long time ago. <laughs> and, um, and then I left uh, there to do the MTA art and, what's art and design program now, and then I came back uh, at Cultural Affairs to be the director, and then they created this job as art assistant commissioner for the, the whole public art stuff, so that's where I ended up. And what would you say is the most surprising aspect of your work in your current role? I think um, for me, it's in enjoying the size. So DOT, which I don't think I mentioned, is almost 6,000 employees. Um, and the art program is a very, very tiny, tiny percentage of those employees. Um, and I didn't think that I would enjoy working at such a large agency. Um, and really, there's some people that I've never spoken to before. And involving them on projects, it definitely um, keeps you challenged and it doesn't feel as repetitive and I, I almost can't imagine working in a, I, I know a lot of arts organizations are very small, um, so I would definitely be a fish out of water there. Um, so I, I think that's something I didn't expect to enjoy. I, I didn't expect to have a lot of relationships with artists um, and it is a relationship when you're doing a public artwork, you're, you're bosom buddies for a good three years at least and uh, for the good, the bad, the happy, the sad, and it's, it's incredible. <laughs> so didn't expect that. Um, I think for me, it's maybe the willingness of other people in the agency to, because <laughs> I think public art can be very intimidating for people who, who don't know what it is or maybe don't know a whole lot about art. Um, and I am really thankful that at the Parks Department, like a lot of our parks managers and operations staff are like, yeah, let's give it a try. Like they're always willing to, um, to to entertain it. So I feel like that has surprised me. I think the openness to it of of communities and other uh, coworkers. Yeah, at DOT, um, a lot of units that we work with, like for example, the Bridges Division, who now they're coming to us asking for murals. Whereas when the program first started, they were like, "What? You're going to paint colors on this gray wall?" And now, um, like I said, they're asking us. So that, similar to Elizabeth's experience, that's, you know, it, it's nice that people notice um, and that they they want to learn um, about the work that is happening in the public art program. Um, at yeah, at DDC because I work with um, so many um, architects, engineers, contractors. Um, something I, I got to learn a lot more about. The, the city over the past few months working with the, the city's pair program with uh, Carlos Irijalba meeting um, different geotechnical um, archaeologists, um, uh, I don't know, yeah, and natural resources, um, a range of different things. Oh, the biggest surprise I learned about eco passages in Western Queens for uh, terrapin turtles. It's awesome. <laughs> like eco passages in New York City, like that's amazing. Yeah. All right, great. This is um, at this point. I think we should open it up to the Q and A for the crowd. Um, great. Thank you very much. Uh, two projects or two agencies that you didn't mention. Lately. And arts and transit, uh, where does your organizations fit into that, or are they auxiliary to that? Well, 
So I, I didn't hear what you said about the first question. I heard arts and transit. So. Um, Yeah, okay. So, so art, arts and transit, which is now arts, art, arts and design, is part of the, um, is, a, is a completely different program that started roughly at the same time our program started, our percent of our program started. And, and Figment, like a lot of the other public art presenters, is just a, a more of a private organization um, doing public art throughout the city. Uh, in terms of graffiti, whether it's art or vandalism, it depends on permission. I guess I would say, like, just a technical question on, on graffiti or just a comment. I actually feel like, at least on public art, people are very respectful of it. Um, I think we've been lucky um, that other artists recognize it as art. Um, but I think we also, as city agencies, um, you know, there's a lot of rules, I think, on, on where artwork can be. <laughs> Thinking about <laughs> touching gen gently on, on graffiti art. In the back. Uh, I have a question. Um, so I actually, I'm going to try to talk with that mic. Um, <coughs> I work more in multidisciplinary kind of installation. Um, so I, I saw a little bit of a trend with the different agencies, but um, I guess I was wondering if you thought that a certain agency or opportunity I think um, that's a good question. I, I, that's in interventions and sculptural kind of immersive work um, is by nature temporary, more temporary based. So I would say more than likely the DOT art program or the parks program um, because there's a little bit more flexibility in some cases um, and if it's something that you're exploring, we can work together to make it you know, a six month installation or thinking about ways to explore that publicly if you've never done that before. Um, and I know in parks especially, there's uh, many locations and I'll, I'll let you talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I think there's definitely a space for like multimedia art and a wide range of different types of artwork. Um, you know, thinking of multimedia too, I think the one uh, medium that maybe is a, is a challenge for us is is anything video based, um, and I think that's that's really the big challenge. There is it's a public outdoor space, and and secu securing you know electricity is very difficult. Um, you know technology is getting better with solar and battery power, and we've had a number of um, you know interactive sound pieces or 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 pieces that. Um, you know, involve light and we're powered by solar and battery power. So I think that might be, become more possible in the future, but um, I think that's maybe really the one medium that is very hard <laughs> to do in yeah. public art. And I will say like parks and, and DOT have spaces that allow for interactivity. So a public plaza or a lawn in a park where, I mean, not to say that percent for art isn't meant to be interacted with, but um, I think there's just some more spaces that uh, if, if that's a goal of your work, um, it allows for people to touch and, and walk around and talk, meet other people that are viewing the work. Um, so that might be a good option. I had a question about the availability of the information you've presented. I think we've all gotten so used to seeing these on Zooms where we know that somebody's gonna send us a link to the whole presentation so we can take the notes we didn't take. Is, are these slides going to be available or a summary of the information with your URL so we know where to get it online? Uh, yeah, some version of it, yeah. Is that going to be distributed to everybody who signed up? Um, this will be posted on youtube.com slash Cooper Union. You'll be able to watch the whole event again. Um, we'll also have a link to the slides, but uh, through the whole event you'll see the slides too. It, again, youtube.com slash Cooper Union. Hi. 
Um, I have a question about how do you work with, uh, well, how the artists and the architects actually collaborate together? Because typically they work in very <coughs> separate realms, right? There's architects, there's artists. Is there any process where you kind of facilitate the introduction of artists to ar architects so that they could collaborate on a project? Uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, in, in my workplace, it, it's all led by the, the capital project. So when the architect or the pro, uh, engineer, we call them prime consultants, are selected, um, basically there's a process when they learn that there is a percent for art on their project. And they have instructions. DDC has um, this thing called design guidelines. And there's actually uh, guidelines for architects of like what to expect on how to um, uh, manage a percent for art on their project. So like, there's these introductions. Uh, they're, yeah, forced relationships. <laughs> some of them work well, some of them, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's inst uh, a guidelines for that and it's built into our program of like how and when architects are supposed to provide certain services or like, when early on can they actually think about like where are the art and sighting locations in within their building that they're designing? Uh, where's the most visual public impact in these places? So that, that sets up the tone and conversation of um, the future public art proposals, which I'd hand over to Kendall. <laughs> yeah, and in addition to what Zinia was saying, so we have, so every single project that an artist is working with us on um, the architects is part of a team and the artist becomes part of the overall team. We do, however, um, select um, artists in a particular kind of way when there's an artist-architect collaboration where the process to select an artist is the artist is actually still, is actually involved in selecting the, the architect as well uh, through a charrette process. So um, that opportunity becomes a better marriage than some of the you know, give and take or you know, forced relationships that might happen in the other, in the other way. Yes. Thank you all so much. Um, for those who deal with percentages, I'm curious to hear when one will become two. Um, can you speak a little bit about your personal advocacy for increasing these budgets for paying artists and you know a collective civic public responsibility to to do the same? Thanks. So I'm assuming you're talking about the percent for art, the percentage for the percent for art. Okay, good. Um, so the, 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 the calculation for the percent for art is 1% um, of the first $50 million of the project, and then half a percent above that, not, to exceed, not required to exceed 900,000. Um, so for capital projects are large, and so 1% may not seem like a lot, but it is quite a bit of, uh, of fun. So our, our projects typically go from, um, as low as 50,000 is the lowest we'll go for a commission and as high as million plus. So, and, and the artist's fee is 20% of that, uh, whatever, the, the, whatever the, the art budget is, the artist gets 20% uh, as a fee that doesn't go into the creation of the work, it's just the, the fee for being the artist. Thank you. My question is about for person for art at DCA so where do you publicize? Where do you publicize the competition? Because there is always a competition, right? <coughs> For a new public artwork. So which website or where do you publicize the new public competition? So uh, we, we usually don't publicize to the world, but we focus on the communities that the artwork is going in. And, um, and you would hear about, and it's on our website. So whenever a project is starting out, uh, we meet with the community board and that's, um, published on our website for that initial meeting for conversation. But we, we are very community focused um, versus sending out to the world and really focus on the community so they could have an opportunity to apply. The artists in this community to have an opportunity to apply. And, and you've done two of our projects, I see you. <laughs> um, yeah, again, we don't publicize to the world unless it's a particular, not for all our projects. Um, so when they're, they're big, multi-whatever projects, we may do a call, and then we publish that on our website. We do NIFA, we do you know, um, social media, 
Uh, but again, when it's very community-based, we, we focus on those communities more than anything else. And we'll take one last question. Hi, I'm collaborating here with my colleague, Carrie Clark from the Point CDC, and we're working on uh, a public art project that's on a publicly owned one acre plaza on the former site of the Spofford Juvenile Detention Center in the Bronx. And it's co the, the public plaza is controlled by HPD, but the surrounding multifamily buildings are privately owned. So we don't seem to fall into the Percent for Art program who I've talked to. Um, and so I, I can't seem to find a home with any of your agencies. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we can engage because this is very community and particip participation oriented project. It fits every, every single criterion that you've described. Nevertheless, it's sort of in an abyss that, <laughs> you know, within at least among the, among the city agencies. So, so are you aware of which agency or which city organization owns the land that you're putting the artwork on? So it's, it's an HPD owned site, but it was the percent for art piece was never contemplated and the project is already partially constructed. So I, I, I've been told, you know, that ship has sailed kind of thing. Yeah, it probably has sailed. Um, <laughs> but um, but a, a lot of, it, so we hear about these, pro, these projects usually from DDC, from, from Genius Group, um, and, or from the, the, the city agency that has a, a, a wish and a hope to do a percent for our pro project there. Um, and we need to get in really early to be able to put things into place where there's a, a, as much funding as possible for the artwork and all that kind of stuff. So if it's in, this, if it's in construction or in, in some a, a late phase of design, it may be too late. But, um, but reach out to me and let me just get more information. This may not be the best way, so if you could reach out to me and, and we could figure this out. So the, the percent for it, or the 1%, like you say, is, is all public funds. And uh, we have no jurisdiction over private funding or, or private projects or projects on private property. Um, though if a private organization wants to do an artwork on a public property, then we, we, we kick in, so to speak. No, no. I just want to thank our panelists tonight. They were very generous. Thank you everyone for coming.